When you were starting on a new team, did the documentation you were given help you understand the domain you were working in? Did the documentation help you and instruct you how to set up your development environment, how to run the app locally? Are you on a project where most architecture diagrams are out of date? Are you tired of sifting through documentation that is out of date or incomplete? Many software projects and teams have these problems. So what makes documentation actually good or effective? In this video, I'll show five principles for good documentation. I'll talk about how it could be structured, what sections it could be made of. And lastly, common problems that prevent documentation from actually adding value. In the previous video, I said, I don't like documentation. I want to amend that statement and say instead, I don't like documentation in the way it's usually done in the real world. Let's look at the characteristics of effective software documentation. To clarify, this is about technical software documentation of a project intended for other developers or colleagues. It is not about end user documentation. It's not about documentation of requirements. That's a different thing. Five principles for good documentation. Number one, it is relevant. Documentation should be written with a single purpose or a specific goal in mind. Otherwise, it doesn't completely answer the question of the reader. It only partially helps them. An example is onboarding. New team members want a getting started, how to install the software into their computer, how to set up the local environment. They want a list of domain terms if they come from an, another company and they don't know the domain they're gonna work in. They want a list of code conventions so the moment they can start contributing, they know what to watch for and what mistakes not to make. If you empathize with this specific use case, you can come up with way better documentation for them. Another example is fixing a common problem that many people have, but they only run into it every other month or so. It's too infrequent to really remember a set of complex steps, but it's good to write it down. Then you can just look it up, especially if it has a known location that people would just go to and look for answers. Another example is a complex domain. There could be software complexity, but there can also be domain complexity. You work in this specific type of work, you build compilers, for example. That's a very complex domain. You just have to deal with that, no matter how simple and, and high quality your code is, you just have to deal with domain complexity. That's very good to document. Another example of a good purpose for documentation is explaining an algorithm that has to be complex for performance reasons, for example. You just have to deal with that complexity, otherwise it, it won't be fast enough. If you document it, if you have a bunch of pseudocode explaining how it actually works, that would save the user from reading complex code that is very difficult to understand. Another good example is instructions for somebody in operations, for example, site reliability engineer. That person is dealing with a whole different way of looking at the software, focusing on availability and scaling and performance. It's very useful to write documentation specifically for that. Next, documentation should be timeless. Keep it as general as possible. Focus on the underlying concepts. Focus on the things that don't change on the next rotation. Avoid referencing specific versions or pointing to specific files. Stuff that just gets out of date really soon. An example is a folder structure or a design pattern that's used all over the code base. These things are reused so often that they're probably a structural ID, a structural concept that you want to document. Like this is how we always solve this kind of problem. And look, we have many of these problems. So we have a standard way of doing that. Good documentation is also tested. Let's look at the onboarding example again. When you onboard new people, they have a certain experience with the documentation. If they have onboarding documentation, they could be having a very bad experience because the onboarding documentation contains only half the problems they're having, or it doesn't complete, completely tell them what they need to do in what order, or for half the steps they need certain permissions that weren't there. Figure out what problems they're having, also listen to their questions while they're onboarding themselves. Everything that is a question is potentially something that should be in the documentation. Not everything needs to be in the documentation, but it's worth looking at the feedback you're getting from these people. Another way of getting feedback is to literally ask for it after their onboarding experience. How could the documentation have helped you in a better way? What things did it not help you with? What was frustrating? Those are especially interesting. Another example is recurring problems. If you are the senior on a project and you get a question that you also got last week and also last month, then this question is now asked three times, third times the charm. So now we can officially label it a, a common problem. We can say 
this is now a thing. If you have a section in your documentation that says FAQ or troubleshooting, put it there, refer to it, because now apparently this is worth documenting. Good documentation is also centralized and accessible. It should have a single location. Documentation shouldn't be scattered across multiple systems. Everybody should know this is the system where, or the web page, or maybe even the Git repository, or the, the, the Confluence system, or whatever, whatever systems you have in place. There should be just one, because then everybody can, can go to this one place and find what they're looking for. It should also be accessible by everybody by default. So if you have a company-wide read-only policy or something like that, add it. Anybody should be able to read this documentation. The more easy it is to read this documentation, to access this documentation, the more likely it is to be helpful. And that is the purpose of documentation. Accessibility is also simple, plain English or whatever language you use. The moment you use simple language and you don't use very complex words and, and many uh, constructed sentences with all kinds of intricate details in there. Yes, uh, how, however intelligent you are, you can probably get through what, what they're saying, but it will still cost you more cognitive load. It will be less helpful. It will cost more energy to parse. Why, why would you? And the fifth principle is that good documentation should be collaborative. You should not own it alone. You should do this as a team. That means that all updates to documentation should be code reviewed. Why not? It will increase the quality. It also means that everybody should be able to edit the documentation. The less friction you can have for updating the documentation, if all developers are working in Git, why not make it a Git repository? It's just a commit and push, then a merge request even. Or if it's a wiki and you can click the edit button, less friction means it's more up to date because people are more likely to actually do it. Next, I've got a list of example sections. Your project probably doesn't need all of them. Treat them as a source of inspiration. Let's look at an overview or an introduction. This is the most obvious one, probably the one that every project should have. It explains the domain which the software lives in. It explains the purpose of the software, what goal it's trying to achieve. It would explain its typical user, maybe. It would highlight a few features. These are the most important features that the user is being helped with. Having this kind of documentation gives you context. It gives you purpose. Why are you doing this work? Why am I contributing this? How does it fit into the bigger picture, the stuff that I'm doing? It could also maybe shortly mention, this is how the software is delivered, especially if that's a more complex thing. If there's another team giving you data, which you then deliver to the users, then that's probably worth mentioning. Another example section is domain. If you are in a domain that is not very well known to everybody, if you're in, especially if you're in a complex domain that uses lots of specific terms or concepts or even acronyms, that's quite common, then you should probably have a page explaining them in your documentation. You should probably explain this context, all these implied constraints and implied requirements that all your colleagues don't know. But if you're unfamiliar with this domain, then you don't know them. There's also implied expectations of the users because the users of the software are obviously in that same domain. Even if your software is very well documented, domains are notoriously badly documented and it can be very confusing to new people who don't know half the words you're speaking of because they don't know the concepts or the acronyms. Another common section in documentation is architecture. And the most important question, the most basic thing that architecture should give us is a list of components with descriptions. A lot of documentation out there doesn't solve this basic question. What are the components I'm dealing with and what do they do? What are their names and what is their purpose? And that is really the first question. If you have documentation on architecture that doesn't have a list of components, but only has a diagram in there, so boxes with names and arrows pointing to other boxes, that is already the second layer of understanding. After you know what the different parts are, then you want to maybe know, or maybe not, if you're onboarding yourself, this might maybe too much detail already, but only as a secondary level, you may want to know what the interactions are, where the initiative lies between communication between different services or whatever. But that's that's really the second question. Is you, If you're onboarding yourself, you first want to know what components am I dealing with? Give me a sense of the authentication system. How do people log in? How do they get their cookie or whatever's going on? And when speaking about diagrams, many, many diagrams are way more complex than necessary for also specific purposes. 
if you have a diagram with a microservice landscape with 20 different microservices, but there's only three personas in this in this user, only three typical users that would connect to these this service landscape. And it turns out for all of them, they're just accessing three services. Those are the hot services. Those are the, the critical path that everybody's connecting to this. This is the most important feature that we're all working on. And all these other services are like 1% of use case. Yes, we have to have export to Excel as well. That's this service on the side. No, that's not what we're building. We're actually doing this and this thing with our software and users are all touching this service. So that's really the core of the whole thing. If you have a diagram that's laying out all these different components as equals and it's not explaining the relation between them, then that's not giving you a lot of information. If you use ADRs, architecture decision records, this is also the section where they should be located. Another common section is getting started. Think of a list of instructions that tells you how to set up your local development environment, how to run the app locally. Preferably this also includes steps to how to make your first commit, how to push the production for the first time. And the good thing about this is you can test this very easily. It's very measurable. After you have followed these steps, you're new to the project. Did you get it done or not? Is it working for you? Is it, if it's not working, then these steps fail. They're not complete. This isn't a very reproducible environment. That might be something you want to improve. Another common section is code conventions. If you have a list of code conventions that you can read, then you can start adding value to the project quicker. This should focus on the stuff that your automation doesn't fix. Your linter, for example, if you use JavaScript and use Prettier, don't mention code formatting stuff. If you use conventional commits, then you should probably use a git pre-commit hook to validate that stuff and don't mention it in the docs. It's just handled by automation. You want to mention all the rules, all the conventions, all the design patterns. You maybe want to mention why a folder is named in a specific way and why there's these kind of files in this folder. Also explaining a bit of the structure. Naming conventions are also very useful to mention in this section of your documentation because which naming convention is being used is very hard to distill from just reading code. Another useful section is that on dependencies. If you have a few key dependencies that are heavily influencing the structure of your projects that determine which directories you use, for example, because you use a framework or you use a few frameworks that combine together in a certain way, then you probably might want to mention this. Don't list everything. There's no use in that. Make sure you list the important ones or if you don't really have important ones, because it's all obvious, you just use create react app standard stack. It's there's nothing special here. Then you probably don't want to have this section at all. Another common section is troubleshooting or FAQ. Think of a list of common issues that uh, problems that a developer may encounter the moment specific solution takes 15 minutes to do, then if you have run into this three times, like I said before, then it just saves time to, to have this written down. It has a very high return on investment to write it down. Now it's just one person working on a solution for this. The trick with having a good FAQ is actually base it on data. So don't come up with these things by yourself. Don't sit down and try to think of frequently asked questions. Start with an empty list and the moment you identify, hey, this is the third or the fourth time I've now heard this question, then start adding it to the list. Lastly, five common problems that documentation can have. Documentation can be hard to understand because it doesn't use simple language. It can be very vague, confusing or not concise at all. If documentation doesn't contain a lot of words, but is only consisting of diagrams, then it's not giving you the information you're looking for either. This type of documentation is unhelpful because it frustrates people. They might give up. They are not finding what they're looking for. They might just move on and make wrong decisions. A good rule of thumb to fix this is to use simple English to write words. And for example, with the architecture, do not paste the diagram in there, but to start with the more basic version of that, which is a list of the components with names and descriptions the interactions and the initiatives and whatever other things that are going on between these components is a second layer that you shouldn't care with in the beginning. Next, documentation can be incomplete. It can have missing chapters. It can leave out important details. This is very unhelpful because it implies you've got the full story while you don't. And the worst version of this is no documentation at all. 
And this usually happens because the docs haven't been written for a specific purpose, for a specific use case. If you write your documentation too general, then it's not actually helping anybody. The third example is out of date documentation. Things have changed in the code, but the documentation wasn't updated. It doesn't reflect the current state of events anymore. This is very unhelpful because the documentation is lying to you. You think you've got your answer, but the reality has changed. And the result is often that people don't use the documentation anymore, which only worsens it. Then apparently it isn't useful. It's better to delete it and start over at some point. For all documentation that is out of date, you can ask yourself the question, is it relevant to a specific purpose? And is it timeless enough? If it is documenting all kinds of details, then maybe it should just be removed because details are likely to change. And if it is not relevant, if it isn't actually serving a specific use case, if it is, for example, this, this diagram made for the software architect to create this mental model and to write it down to solve a specific problem, but it isn't actually helping the person that is onboarding onto the team, or it isn't helping the SRE that is keeping this system alive in production, then probably shouldn't have it there. Documentation can also be overly specific. If it doesn't have enough high level concepts, no high level things, it's only specific details. If it only focuses on describing which classes do what, then it, it doesn't actually give you any value. This is very unhelpful because it costs you time. You spend time reading lots of this documentation and somebody has also, by the way, spent time to write this documentation. But as a reader, you don't get your answers from it. You need high level insights before you can understand the details. And these details get out of date very soon, by the way, but that's, that's another problem with this. But they don't help you get answers to the high level questions. You always have high level questions before you have detailed questions. And another one is where documentation is used as a solution to a problem where it isn't the solution to that specific problem. Often when you hear or when you think it yourself, we need to document this, this is complex. Then the, the problem is actually in the code and this problem cannot be solved with documentation. This is a problem that needs to be solved with higher code quality. Actually, if you have better separation of concerns, if you have a better interface that isn't actually a leaky abstraction, if you have loose coupling in this case where it, right now you have tight coupling, if you improve the code quality on these specific topics, then you will not need documentation because the details will speak for themselves. You only need to document the high level concepts. As much as possible, you want to write code that doesn't require documentation. This documentation is a waste because writing up all this complex documentation for this complex solution is better spent simplifying the solution, actually designing a better solution. The solution here is do not solve everything with writing new documentation. There's actually many things you can do to either increase knowledge transfers, if that's your goal, or uh, increase onboarding by making sure, for example, if you have, if you work with merge requests, you have comments, you have reviews on, on merges that you do, and every remark that you have, you speak out to a colleague verbally, you sit next to them. What if you would also write it down, if you use GitLab or GitHub, and you would actually add a comment into the system, then the next person that's onboarding themselves could read the last five merge requests, read the comments, and learn from that more. They can sit next to you, and then they can maybe watch one or two of these, but they're always gonna learn more if these comments are actually in the system. Another example is using conventional commits. You learn this one rule, you can read suddenly all the commits. Another example is semver. This leads to people having a better intuition about a specific version number. And when speaking about knowledge transfer, the best way to achieve that kind of thing is probably pair programming and pair merge request reviewing. That's the true way to create knowledge transfer and also shared ownership. To summarize, when working with documentation, think of the principles, avoid the common problems. Is it actually solving a problem? And realize that documentation has a cost, both for the writer and for the reader, and a very heavy cost for the reader if they have a different use case than what the documentation was initially intended for. And also realize that some problems just aren't solved by writing more documentation, especially code quality. That's it. How about you? Did you have mainly bad or mainly good experiences with documentation? Why is that? I hope this was helpful. I hope this was useful. If you have any questions or if you have a request for a future video, please let me know in the comments. Thank you very much for watching.